So a couple of years ago, we talked about modern vintage from 6 a.m. And there was a lot that was really discussed about where this band had been and where that album took them. After looking at all the figures, what you actually see is that that album was a bit of a step backwards. Uh, it didn't crack uh, the same levels of the Billboard charts as its predecessors and started a downward trend, potentially. But here we are with Prayers for the Dam. This is actually the first of two albums uh, that 6AM is hoping to get released in 2016. And it's an ambitious project. Uh, we've seen this before from bands such as Five Finger Death Punch and Go Eat and Cambria, Stone Sour. So, what is 6AM bringing to the table and how does it differ from modern vintage? Uh, for one, Prayers for the Damned, part one, uh, it feels like a very honest album. And this is one that feels very honest whenever it comes to the, the lyricism that is, uh, that, that, that's being stated here. There's a lot of different ideas that are being presented. And while some people may really just color these guys off as radio hard rock or radio metal, whichever that you really wish to describe it, uh, the reality of it is, is that you have to remember the history of Nicky Six himself. You have to remember that he was a part of a hair metal band that got radio airplay, got exposure, and did craft and change up their writing a little bit in order to sort of, you know, accompany that. And you have to also understand that 6AM is meant to be a brand new individual project. It's not meant to be essentially Motley Crue, part dos. So, the honest lyricism that is possessed on this record definitely feels a little bit semi-autobiographical for Nikki Six. Either that, or perhaps it's something that's representative to either people that he's known, that he has known, knows, or, again, perhaps different sides of himself. And that's seen with songs such as Better Man, which is one of the highlights off of this disc. That honesty registers throughout his vocal tone throughout the entirety of the song. That emotion really pours from his voice through the tones that you get. And the music that swirls around it is one that certainly fits also. And that's something that is a much better sign than Modern Vintage, which by and large, while it was a kind of alright album, it was interesting and kind of good for just an impulse purchase, uh, was by and large kind of soulless. But this is a song uh, that also shows that DJ Ashba has a theme sort of running on this disc, where he has a lot of tones that will rem remind you a bit of the higher register uh, of like a Tom Morello. But he's, he doesn't want to go full Tom Morello, if you know what I'm saying. He doesn't want to go all the way because of, you know, gimmick infringement or something. But it actually works very nicely with this music. It works fantastically with it, considering it sometimes presents a, either a, a sense of emotional urgency. It goes and couples itself with the music uh, in order to further craft or further create a, a different state of emotional health for both the song and perhaps whatever the song's protagonist may be. I'm always very interested in lyricism because that is usually where the stories are being told and how they couple with the musicianship. And on Better Man, this was one that was done quite well. Now the opening song, Rise, is a bit of a different story. If you're not one for annoying introductions, if that causes you to turn off a song quicker than you're willing to actually, you know, stick it out, then you might as well just skip right to you have to, or you've come to the right place, which is track two. Rise immediately kind of got me off on the wrong foot with this album, considering its introduction was meant to be a little bit uplifting, it was meant to be a little bit motivating, it's supposed to have a bit of that air of get your ass up, but instead just told me we're going to be as irritating as possible in this introduction, and then it launches into what really just appears and sounds as a rather mediocre, radio-friendly, hard rock song. But a song like Can't Stop, which sounds equally as hokey at times, uh, track number six, especially during its introductory parts, actually has a riff that, as you listen to it, continues to sort of fester its way deeper and deeper inside of your brain. It's one of those that actually has the earworm effect and causes you to actually turn on the song, as opposed to just not really feeling it throughout the entire course. Instead, you start to slowly turn on it and start to dig it. It's something that actually breeds this song into being a bit of a standout also, and coming right after Better Man, it means that the middle portion of this album does have a little bit of strength behind it. Now, whenever we get a little bit deeper into this disc, we start to notice a little bit of length. 
we start to notice with songs such as Everything Went to Hell, Belly of the Beast, and uh, The Last Time My Heart Will Hit the Ground, which is not as long as the previous two, you start to notice a little bit of themology that is really opening up. These songs feel very personal, almost as though they have a, a, a certain direct target in mind, either that or they're meant to, once again, represent Nicky himself. And based off of that, based off of that honesty, and coupled off of some strong riffs and some strong construction, this actually creates this album's version of, uh, of a strong second half, or this album's version of a more unique second half. We just spoke about that recently with another album, where the second half blew the first half away and made it seem like it was a lot better, a lot more creatively structured. It was the Fallujah disc, if I do recall. But this is one where it just feels that these songs have the honesty and the construction to keep you involved, whereas if the tone of the first half of this disc would have continued, it may have gotten a little bit tiresome in order to listen to the remainder of this disc. Rise of the Melancholy Empire is the final track. It's six minutes in length, and it's one where, based off of that length, based off of the fact it's the longest track on the disc, you're wondering if there's going to be any of that creative spark that uh, final songs can sometimes allude to or sometimes grant. And what you actually get is an introduction that has both piano and guitar molding together as one, which does set up a fairly creative overall body of construction. I will say this is a song that feels a bit unique, but maybe just not enough. Again, similar to how DJ Ashba is kind of using some Morello tone, but not going full Morello, this is a song that aims to be unique and aims to be sort of one of its kind on this disc, but doesn't go full unique or full one of its kind. It does possess one of DJ Ashba's best uh, solos on the disc, and overall the crafting process of this song feels like it had a lot more in the way of intricate and, you know, interesting ideas to sort of accompany it. But by and large, at the end of the day, it feels very similar to some of the other tracks on the disc. And its differences are it just ends up being very subtle and perhaps not enough full tilt boogie in order for it to feel as though it, it, it ranks among those great different, those great odd, those grand experimental final tracks that we've perhaps seen in years past. So what do we say about this album? Modern Vintage, as we said, was an album that felt a bit soulless, but was still a, an album that was worthy of a pickup because it had some interesting quality. This is one that's actually a bit different. It's one that feels very real. It feels like it has a lot of soul and a lot of heart behind it, a lot of personality, uh, but at times can just seem a little bit typical. It's not to say that 6AM is incapable of releasing a fantastic hard rock album because this album, while it's not fantastic, it's above average. It does have a lot of great movement to it, and it is enjoyable, especially if you're a fan of this style of music. I think a lot of 6AM fans will see this as perhaps a return to form after Modern Vintage maybe blew them a dud. I'm interested to see how this is going to couple also with the second volume of this series that's supposed to come later this year. Are we going to see a genuine difference between the two of them, or is the construction going to be similar, and it's going to be like a load and reload scenario, where both of them essentially have the same tone, it was just that the sessions were overpopulated with songs that they felt were worthy of making the cut. It's really hard to say, but I think this is an album that's at least worthy of an 80 out of 100. It still has a lot of great quality to it, but there are still some places that they can improve. But I want to know what you guys think about this. What do you think about Prayers for the Damned, Volume 1, by 6AM? Is Nikki Six really past his prime of crafting a great rock album? Or is this just the start of good things to come? Let me know in the comments below. My name is Cover Killer Nation, and I'll talk to each and every one of you guys next time. Whatever that may be.